Bishop, how are you? Ron, blessed be God, doing well. in the well. middle of summer. And I'm delighted that our good folks join us by, obviously, by radio, uh, by video, yeah. by Facebook, and every other media. We are everywhere. I'm thrilled. Now, I'm before thrilled. we get to anything serious, yes. I, I notice from the last show. Aren't you happy? You're, you're minus some uh, paraphernalia. I'm minus an air cast. <laughs> so folks, thanks so much for your good prayers and thoughts and so many greetings for and get well wishes for me after my right shoulder bicep tendon tear and rotator cuff tear surgery. I had the air cast run for five, almost five and a half weeks. Okay. And so now I'm in physical therapy Someone said to me, Bishop, you know what PT means? And I said, no. And they said, pain and torture. I said, oh, my. So obviously, if you've ever had any physical therapy, you know that it takes work. And what's that classic line? No pain, no gain. Yep, so go. I'm working very hard, folks, to get my right shoulder completely back in order. And I thank you for your continued prayers. That it might be just that. Now, I noticed when you came in, you weren't like shaking hands with it or anything. No, because I just got that <laughs> off. And so I, okay. I don't want you pulling me to the yeah. Yeah, floor I with my, with I my arm that was so so damaged and uh, operated on. So oh, thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> well, before we get to our gospel, uh, what's on your mind, on your schedule? Thanks. Just a couple of things to mention. And one is I, I will have the great joy, folks. You know, it's not every day that uh, a priest who has served as someone's spiritual director in the seminary gets to go to his Episcopal ordination. So it's a very exciting thing. I will be able to go on uh, for Friday, July 22nd to the Episcopal ordination of the newly elect Bishop of St. Augustine, Florida. His name is Bishop-elect Eric Pohlmeyer. He's a priest of Little Rock, Arkansas. And I am just thrilled to death that I'll have an opportunity to go to that ordination and installation as he is ordained the new bishop of St. Augustine. Have you ever been to St. Augustine? I've never been to St. Augustine. Well, it's a very Catholic area and a beautiful, I think maybe one of the oldest Catholic regions in the southeast. Area. It's the first place that yeah. Catholic Mass was celebrated uh, in the United States, okay. and it has the oldest cathedral. It's beautiful. So I can't yeah. wait to, oh, to, be, to it. see it. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just a splendid man. So please pray for him as he's ordained a bishop that he might be a holy and faithful bishop in the Catholic Church. Wonderful. And then uh, I on Sunday the 24th, of course, you know, I always try to mention where I'll be in parishes, so I'm just delighted that I'll be uh, with Father David Serrata and the parishioners of St. Mary's in Defiance. St. Mary and its coupled newly twinned parish, St. John's in Defiance, are newly twinned. Father Serrata has already been the pastor of St. John's, and now he'll be officially installed also as pastor of St. Mary. So I'll be delighted to be in defiance with the good folks there and Father Dave Serrata. And then I think, Ron, there's something that might interest you greatly. What's up? Which is the World Day for Grandparents and the Elderly. <laughs> is Would that be? Would you be in that category, well, Ron? I, I, <laughs> yeah, I might fall into both of those, Bishop. Maybe. So a lot of yeah. our viewers and listeners know that our Holy Father designated uh, the celebration of the World Day for Grandparents and Elderly on the fourth Sunday of July, which is the closest Sunday to the feast day of Saints Joachim and Anne, the grandparents of Jesus, Mary's mother and dad. So uh, it's also very special to me because that was my mother's feast day, and that's the day I was ordained a bishop, the 26th of July. So the World Day this year is being celebrated on Sunday, July 24th, the theme Old a in old age they will still bear fruit from Psalm 92, and it indicates here the theme is meant to emphasize how grandparents are a gift both to society and to the church, and so I just invite all of you to celebrate that day, and for all our viewers and listeners who may be grandparents or maybe in that elderly category, Ron. Yeah. I'm not sure what elderly means. I think it's a state of mind, right? <laughs> but it certainly is a, a certain age group. Some people call it, in Italian, it's the terza età, the third age. The third age. But what a gift the wisdom and prudence and understanding of older folks are for their families and, of course, for the church. I'll make sure that I mention to my wife, Deborah, too, that you put her in that elderly well, I didn't, Ron. You just did. Oh, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Anything else? Thank you. I think we should push ahead. All yeah. Right. Let's go to our gospel. Thank you. 
which is a recent gospel uh, from Luke, and it looks like it's, uh, what Sunday is it? It's the 16th, uh, the 16th Sunday. Sunday in Ordinary Time. Thank you. Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary, who sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. And the Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. Your thoughts, Bishop. Can I say something before you say something? Please. You know, I've been listening to that gospel my whole, well, not my whole life, but pretty, your Catholic life, life. a lot of my life. (laughs) And that is a really hard one for people, I think, because everything we're told is to serve and to, right, to Mm -hmm. be doing, Mm -hmm. right? Every, and this just seems to fly in the face of that. I think it's so difficult for people. I agree. And I think sometimes we get a little confused because we don't hone in on just what the gospel tells us. So that's what I'd like to do for our viewers and listeners. And one of the keys here is that Mary sat beside the Lord at his feet, listening to him speak. And right away, people get this idea that this is pitting Martha against Mary. Mm -hmm. And of course, that the one is what everybody needs to do and the other is not. But listen to what the the gospel says. Luke says, Martha, burdened with much serving, Mm -hmm. came to him and asked, don't you care? My sister's left me by myself to do the serving. Tell her to help me. Well, there's something a little underneath of that, Ron, because we know the reality is Jesus is there. These are some of his best friends, right? Well, if these are best friends, why should she be burdened by the serving? And if Jesus is not worried about it, why is she? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a first point that we have to point out, because obviously Jesus is not concerned. He's not concerned about what they're going to feed him. They're his best friends. He knows he's going to get a nice meal. But for some reason, Martha is burdened by, by this. Mary, now again, it pits the two against. And we know in some families, you know, when it comes time for the meal, People jump up to clean up the kitchen and others sit there and do nothing, right? That's not what we're talking about. But he goes on to say, notice who he addresses. He addresses Martha and the address is directly to her. Martha, you're anxious and worried about many things. There's really only need of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part. So in other words, I think the better part is being with Jesus, listening to Jesus welcoming Jesus into their home and spending time with Jesus. The less important thing are the practical details of whether the plates are on the table or the oven is ready. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at because he says, you are anxious and worried about many things. Now, sure, I can tell you when we had guests at home and I was growing up, my mother was anxious and worried to be able to put on a good meal and to be an excellent host. And she was an extraordinary host in that regard in our home. But I would say the line is, are you anxious and worried? We can prepare a meal and not be anxious and worried, right? We can do a lot of things and not be anxious and worried. And if we are with Jesus and if we're listening to Jesus and if we're welcoming Jesus into our home, then really there is no point in being anxious and worried. So I would suggest that it's not pitting Martha against Mary. I don't think it's so much this idea of active life and contemplative life, which are at odds with one another. But instead, I think it's this question honing in, what does he actually say to her? You are anxious and worried about many things, and there is no need to be. Fundamentally, because he doesn't say this, but I can hear him saying, you don't need to be anxious and worried. I'm here. Yeah. And I think that's what he says to all of us. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Let's sneak a question in here. Can we get that yes, in, Ron? we're going to before our break. Beautiful. Uh, it's Dylan from Oregon says, dear Bishop, a friend of ours has asked me and my wife to be godparents to their child. Although I was raised Catholic, I was never confirmed and rarely attend mass. I do not feel qualified to serve such an important role but I am very willing to ensure the child is raised Catholic if something happens to the parents. 
Are we eligible to serve as godparents or should we respectfully decline? Thanks, Dylan. So Dylan, if I may say, first of all, I, I am edified by your writing in and your question. And I want to say, Dylan, I deeply admire your humility and your honesty. So kudos to you. And I would say, would that we all could learn from such humility and such honesty. I would also say you indicate here you were raised Catholic, but never confirmed and rarely attend mass. So I'm sorry to hear that, Dylan. And so that my next point has to be to say, Dylan, I am personally inviting you to engage with a parish priest or or deacon or, or fellow, you might know someone Catholic in your local parish in Oregon, and to seek confirmation and to seek being one with the faith in which you were raised. So I personally, I personally, Dylan, invite you and your wife into the Catholic Church and into full communion by becoming confirmed as well. Now, the third part, you indicate, are we eligible or should we respectfully decline? And Dylan, if you've ever listened to this show, you know I always say go to the sources. And the answer, sadly, is that you need to respectfully decline. Why is that? Because this is what the church asks, Dylan, of someone who's going to be a sponsor. And that is, in the end, to be a godparent, this is what the church says. To be a Catholic who has been confirmed and has already received the most holy sacrament of the Eucharist and who leads a life of faith in keeping with the function to be taken on. So if one is going to be a sponsor for someone who is going to be raised in the Catholic Church, it only makes sense that that person would be in a good example to the child in living and practicing that faith themselves. So that's why I noticed, Dylan, I made the invitation to you and your wife first to enter into the church, to be confirmed, and to be faithful Catholics. And it's a sad thing that you would have to respectfully decline but it's also an honest thing, and that's what you are, Dylan. You have to be honest to say, why? how could I possibly serve as a sponsor if I myself am not living out the faith that I'm actually going to sponsor this child in, in the Catholic Church? So again, I invite you to come in, and then maybe you'd be able to be a sponsor in the future. All right. Thank you, Bishop. Thanks, Dylan, for that question. Folks, we got to take just a quick break. Don't go anywhere. I have a whole list here. Oh, we sure do. For the bishop. Stay right where you're at. Annunciation Radio is your voice for the Diocese of Toledo. Serving Northwest and North Central Ohio for over 10 years, Annunciation Radio is your home for the Bishop's Corner and other great local shows from our own diocese like Say Yes to Life with Peter Range, Understanding Scripture with Father Dave Nuss, and our live local Catholic morning show, Morning Offering. Listen live on your radio or anytime on demand on the Annunciation Radio app or website. And we're back here at the Bishop's Corner uh, with Bishop Daniel Thomas. Folks. Welcome back, folks. So glad you joined us. We are always eager to get your questions. You can submit those at our website or mobile app. You can also email the questions to bishop at annunciationradio.com. We do ask maybe you give us your first name, uh, the town you're from, something like that, so the bishop has an idea who he's talking to. We do our very best, don't we, Bishop, to try to get them all in. But we're going to try today, Ron. Don't always make it, but let's give it a shot. Thank we're you. We're going to go to Mark who's an online listener and viewer, says, Dear Bishop Thomas, I've heard that Pope Francis has written a document setting forth liturgical reforms. In view of his clamping down on the traditional Latin Mass, please help me understand this new document. I have not read it, and it seems a lot of people have opinions and views that they are eager to share. <laughs> Imagine I, that. I love the way you always go to the sources, and I ask that you point me in the right direction so I can learn what he is saying and what it means. Thanks. Mark, thank you so very, very much, and I appreciate your question. So the document, folks, to which Mark is referring, it's a, a new document from the Holy Father. It's an apostolic letter. He often addresses topics in the form of these apostolic letters. And uh, for show and tell, I'm showing what I downloaded just this morning, obviously. I have 
read it before, but I just downloaded the copy from the Vatican website. So the first point, Mark, is, and you're absolutely right, so thanks for knowing, go to the sources. I would simply direct you to the Vatican website, Mark, where you can find Desiderio Desideravi. That's the Latin name for the document which he recently published, and it's taken from the Gospel of Luke, and you might remember where Jesus at the Last Supper says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So those two words are loosely taken from that scripture passage, which normally any papal document is taken from the first words. So, and I did notice, Mark, you mentioned here, it, you say where the, the Pope sets forth liturgical reforms, but it's interesting, the language of the letter says, on the liturgical formation of the people of God. So I don't think it's so much about he's setting forth new reforms, Mark, as it is he's simply commenting on the right formation of the people of God. And that's across the board because this letter is addressed to bishops, priests, deacons, consecrated men and women, and all the lay faithful. So if I may, just uh, there is a quote here I'd like to just talk out and it's in number 61 toward the end. And he says, in the, this letter, I've wanted simply to share some reflections, which don't exhaust, of course, the treasure of the celebration of the Holy Mysteries. And he asks everybody to draw from the wellspring of spirituality of the Holy Eucharist. Fundamentally, he's also in a good part of it, Mark, talking about the Ars Celebrandi. So can you Translate that, sure, Ron, for sure us I from the Latin. Why are you asking? So that simply means, Mark, <laughs> the art of celebration. And the Holy Father is, is saying that that celebration needs to be worthy, and it needs to be appropriate, and it needs to be in accord with the norms that the Church sets forward. So either to ignore or change those norms, or to look back to something else where those norms do not apply— is not where we need to be as a Catholic Church. So I would invite you go to the source. You can read the document for yourself. It's it's quite readable, and I would say it's about uh, this is about twenty pages or so. So you're welcome to look at it yourself. And I always say, Mark, and I noticed you have here. I've not read it, and it seems a lot of people have opinions and views that they are eager to share. <laughs> Mark, the problem is a lot of them who are eager to share and have views haven't read it either. So I would say read it. Be well informed so that you're able then to respond in an intelligent way. All right, good. Thank, Thank you, good. Mark. Uh, we're going to go to Paul, Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Toledo. Dear Bishop Thomas, I watch the evening news again and it makes me sick. Why doesn't the Catholic Church excommunicate President Biden? He keeps politicking on women's rights and the right to abortion. I understand the party's view on this, but he continues to go on and on about women's rights and the right to have abortions. Thank God our Supreme Court took the stand against this, but if he, he continues to promote these rights to an abortion. If the average Catholic took this stand, he'd be excommunicated. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So first, obviously, you know, I, I think, Ron, how many times have we answered this question? Plenty. And I think, you know, there's, there's no question of Paul of where I stand. I've been very, very clear. I've quoted canon law. I've indicated that someone who is in a state of grave sin should be able to, in their conscience, recognize that they should not be approaching the sacrament or receiving the Eucharist unless they have first gone to confession and appropriately stepped away from any kind of obstinance in continuing in that grave sin. So that said, Paul, you know, you ask, why doesn't the church excommunicate Biden? Well, canonically, the person who is charged with addressing any grave sin in that regard is the individual's bishop. I've said this before. That's why you may or may not know Paul, Archbishop Cordelione in San Francisco has, in fact, as the bishop, addressed Nancy Pelosi and addressed her stance, not unlike Biden, regarding abortion and spoken out very, very clearly in a medicinal way to try to draw her back to the church. And it's a very pastoral response to say, this is the state in which you find yourself, and this is what I'm calling you to as your bishop. So but people talk about this as politicization, not at all. This is a pastoral response of a pastor and shepherd fearing for the soul of one of his flock. Now, short of that happening, and I agree, thank God, the Supreme Court 
Paul took the stance it did. Short of any of that happening, I would say, Paul, my question is, well, why don't the Catholic faithful write to the president and to the Archbishop of Washington and say, why is this man treated differently and why is this not being addressed? So I, I would just suggest that, you know, I, I can't act in this regard. The bishop of the place is charged to act. And I would suggest then write to the Archbishop of Washington and to the president himself and say, it appears that you who know better, I presume he knows better, how could he possibly not, that what he is endorsing and now, you know, almost vociferously saying that this is absolutely antithetical to one of the most foundational teachings of the Catholic Church. Bishop, we only have time for one more. I'm going to uh, move to this question here. Okay. It's kind of timely. Thank you. Um, it's from uh, Steve from Most Blessed Sacrament. Dear Bishop Thomas, uh, with Pope Francis adding two women to the panel that chooses bishops, the question, po question posed to me the other day was how this pope views bigger roles for women in the church. And more specifically, if he is moving toward changing church teaching on female priests and deacons. Is a scenario like this even possible? Why can't the church ordain women? Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. So your question is packed, actually, with a number of questions. But let me just uh, relate to some of them and, and try to answer some of them. First, Steve, you, you asked uh, Pope Francis adding two women to the panel that chooses bishops. So that's not technically correct, Steve, because, in fact, the congregation, former Congregation for Bishops, now known as the Dicastery for Bishops, where I, in fact, worked for 15 years in the Vatican, they do not choose the bishops. They review the cases and the recommended candidates, and then it's given to the Holy Father. So that panel doesn't choose the bishop. So I just want to make sure that's very, very clear. And then the second one is that the Holy Father has added three women to be members of that dicastery. That simply means that those, they will join a group of cardinals, bishops, archbishops, who will review the cases of candidates presented for the Episcopacy. And the Holy Father told us that was coming. It was his intention in order to include a broader, if you will, a broader scope together with laity and women. Now, you then go on to say, is he moving toward changing, changing church teaching on female priests and deacons? Well, we know that the teaching, uh, first of all, on deacons, we know, uh, you may, Steve, that he has twice impaneled a group of people to study the question of deacons and the diaconate, and there has been no conclusion from either of those panels. Regarding female priests, we know that that's the time immemorial teaching of the church, and if you look at two documents in particular, Steve, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Inter in Signores, and, of course, Pope John Paul II, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, that's where you can see all of the church's teaching and all of the reasoning as to why the church reserves the ordination of priests to men, because first and foremost, that's what Jesus himself did. All right. So that's the simple answer to that question. And Bishop, we are out of time. My word. We have about a minute or so to go. Is okay. There anything in the middle of summer that you need? say to the people <laughs> <laughs> that I need to say to the well, people. Yeah, it's summer. I mean, I, I think the thing I always need to say is uh, be holy, <laughs> right? So whatever it's you're too short, you've got about 45 seconds, whatever you're doing this summer, I would simply say <laughs> be holy because as my Cardinal Archbishop, when I was growing up in the seminary, we would get ready for leaving for the summertime. And he would always say, in his inimitable way, he would say, well, remember, there's no vacation from your vocation. Oh, there you go. And I thought Very that good. was a classic line. So whatever your vocation, whether it's a married spouse, whether you are single, whether you are a consecrated religious deacon or priest, I think there is no vacation from our vocation. That's very good. I think it's a great phrase. Um, and, you know, I'm from an area where the parishes I'm involved, the main, my main parish and the other one are in a vacation area. I know. Yes. Beautiful and area. It's very edifying to me how packed the masses are. I've heard that. And you're from Marblehead. Yeah, Marblehead. And I've heard the church all summer it's long is packed. Totally packed. Blessed be God. I mean, 730 in the morning, it'll be completely packed. 
That's so, phenomenal. So faithful Catholics are out on vacation, but they're finding a way to get to Mass. So, that is edifying. Yeah, it yeah. really is. So, so no vacation from our vocation. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Could we get a prayer and a blessing? Surely. Let's pray together the collect from the 16th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Let us pray. Show favor, O Lord, to your servants, and mercifully increase the gifts of your grace, that made fervent in hope, faith, and charity, they may be ever watchful in keeping your commands. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. And and Ron, I have to apologize, to, especially for those who are watching, because I haven't had a lot of PT yet, and I can't get my arm up okay. far enough, okay. but I'm still blessing with the right <laughs> hand now. Thanks be to God. All right. Thank folks. you, Ron. We'll see you again right here next week at the Bishop's. Thanks, folks. Come back and join us.